All right, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Late Night Shots Podcast, episode 53 today. So, you know, as there's a bunch of big events going down, I think something I actually heard on Flow Radio Live this morning when I just tuned in for a little bit is Kirk Leah versus Paris, most likely happening in the quarterfinals of Big Tens. So I think this is actually going to be the biggest match of, the, of that tournament, you know, at that weight class. So obviously Gable's probably going to cruise through to the finals, you know. If seeds hold, he will have Tate Orndorff in the – Quarterfinals, he has a bye in run one, the one and two seed do. As far as I've seen, because they have 14, I'm assuming the one and two seed are going to get buys. Second round, he's either going to have Luffman or Christian Lance, depending on who wins that match. It was one double overtime by Luffman last time, you know. I don't see a 13 seed or a 12 seed really making an upset there to somehow pull that spot. So, yeah, so no, I'm listening to Flow Radio Live. Christian Bob said Paris takes it pretty handily. So, well, let's talk about it. You know, that's the first thing. So, Derek, take it away. I don't see Paris taking this match, like Pyle said on the radio. Um, he very well could win the match. Nobody is saying that Paris isn't, you know, that caliber of a wrestler to be able to go out there, have a match with Kirk Levitt, and take it on to the next round of the Big Tens. He very well could. He very well could, and that's, you know, that could very well happen. But um, we haven't seen Kirk match up against anybody of that high of a level yet. Yeah. You know, we saw him against the guy from Michigan. He's, you know, whatever. He had some really rough matches this year. He's a walk-on, you know, just a tough kid. You know, he went out there and tried his best, and, you know, he got pretty handled by both of them. You know, having to wrestle basically the top four guys in the nation, he wrestled all of them. And that was, you know, rough season for him. but. I mean, he cradled him up and put him on his back. I mean, that's just kind of what everybody did to him. They detected him or pinned him, those top four guys. And I'm counting Kirk as a top four guy in that, being mm-hmm. Gable, Paris, Cassiope, and Kirk. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, rankings don't say that, but I, that's what I believe about four heavyweights at the moment right now. Um, but, you know, obviously, Dave said it. I think everybody said it this far, you know, Gable, Paris, and Kirk are top three. Nobody with the brain argues that. You know, if you're an Iowa fan, you might wonder if Cassiope is what it is. But Cassiope, Colton Schultz are kind of just in that that area, that island right there just by themselves, you know. I don't know if Schultz and Cassiope may be a very interesting matchup. It's actually not I think about it. I might want to go over that later before Nationals, depending on he's old. Stay tuned for that if it does happen, though. So we'll walk through this, right? What are their past matches, right? They both only wrestled Gable once. They've never wrestled each other, to my knowledge. When Paris and Gable wrestled, it was a pretty controlled match for Gable, you know? Paris was getting in on his legs, but he was kind of getting shut down immediately. And Gable versus Kirkley, a 3-2 match in high school. You know, obviously, it was considered the match of the year by pretty much everyone, you know? And it's not often you see heavyweights going at it in high school, apparently, you know? Heavyweights in college, are, they're all athletes. Heavyweights in high school, you have, like, either the athletes or just, like, the slobs, right? These guys going at it was, like, you don't see that much action in most lightweight matchups. Kirkley got in Gable's legs, almost took him down a couple times. Gable's size and him using his hips was kind of the deciding factor. And there was one takedown late, early in the third period, which kind of, again, sealed the win for Gable Stevenson, three to two, you know? Craig Fleet bumped was the number one two twenty in the country. Gable was the number one two eighty five pound in the country. I think this was when Braxton Amos was at one ninety five at this point, I'm pretty sure. So that was like a juggernaut upper weights, so just just the lineup right there. That was, yeah, that was insane see. to actually look at. You know, I feel like the, both these guys are missed all this is that regular duel. That you should see that how packed that gym was. It was able to probably honestly one of the most packed high school wrestling matches yeah. I've ever seen. 100%. If not the, you know, yeah. Obviously, the who's number one match with Soriano and Fix is gonna be hyped up more, just because you know where it was at, how deep it went into. But you know, Soriano was my predi- was the predicted winner. I'm pretty sure of that match ended up getting it done 26 minutes into overtime. <laughs> that was just that was just wild. But honestly, if match goes on that long, most people just tend to stop focusing. It's just whatever it is. But you look at this match, right? They were both actually committed to Minnesota at a point. And they did want Kirk Fleet to go 197. Kirk Fleet 
could not make one. Somebody's beeping their car alarm outside. Oh my god, I'm sorry about that. But they wanted to go 197. He didn't want to make the weight class anymore. You know, he's a guy who I don't think ever cut weight. Did never cut weight throughout high school. No, I don't think Gable did ever. And these guys that don't have to, you know, Gable obviously started taking it more seriously after Kassar stunned him. But that's really what it is, right? And then he committed to Oklahoma State. Okay, changes his mind there. He's like, okay, I want to practice with guys like Snyder, Desi. And, again, you have guys like Gary, Singletary, Colin Moore, Miles Martin. That's a great practice room right there, right? But I think Kyle Snyder was the one guy, you know, you obviously want to practice with an Olympic champion. No, that's, that's guy is going to make you better. Kyle Snyder made the move to the New Line Wrestling Club. So I don't know if that's exactly what impacted his choice, but that seems like the most obvious answer because it was shortly after that Kurt Fleet made the switch, went to Penn State. And, uh, yeah, I think uh, most Penn State fans are happy about that, you know. Ohio State fans wish they could have him, you know. It is what it is. You know, they got, they got Orndorff, a solid opponent himself, you know, has returning All-American, if you want to count that. But – Kirk Fleet was like, is a high ticket wrestler to pull, and uh, Kale did that pretty much without even trying. So, yeah, right. you know, that just goes to show how good of a program they have there and how good of an upper room they are. So, we actually yeah, talked we... about this before, right? So, Kirk Fleet is going heavyweight. You know, he takes a redshirt year, takes the Olympic redshirt. This year doesn't count, so I think that's the only reason he came out, right? But as we talk about it, Kirk Fleet's coming back from injury, right? I we've said this before. I've talked to a few people. You know, obviously, I'm not going to go ask anybody from Penn State this because I don't think they're they're not, they're not going to answer the question. Me, but, but why would Kale Sanderson put out Greg Kirkley for the postseason when he's not 100 percent healthy, which he doesn't look to be? You know, he's still wearing the brace on his knee and the sleeves, or whatever. If he didn't think he could win it, you know, that just doesn't seem like a smart option in a year where it obviously doesn't count. Obviously, you know, you're going to have the team race, right? And uh, it was a 16-17 duel last season. What it would have came down to was either having Kassar or Kerfoot at heavyweight, which I think we can all agree that most likely would be in Cassiope. You know, whether it's handedly or whether it's just a decision, that would have won them the duel. I think this year, we look at it, we have a lot of toss-up matchups along the place. You know, obviously Spencer Lee's a favorite at 125. That's not going to change no matter what. As much as we like to gas up Rob Howard, it is what it is right there. Howard can yeah, definitely but I, make a, I think we, Howard can I do make a think run. You can't not say that Howard has a chance of being on that podium. He yeah, very a hundred percent. Howard Howard can Howard has the potential to place second. I think a lot of people play weight class do, whether it's Barnett, whether it's Schroeder, whether it's some other guys down there. But if he places, if he gets to the finals, that's huge for Penn State because that just gives them more team points, right? You know, obviously the year before Devin Schnupp didn't qualify for nationals twenty nineteen. That being said, Roman Bravo Young right now has to be favorable to Santo. But that being said, it's a toss-up, right? I think it makes it a lot better for Roman Bravo Young that DeSanto pulls Sammy Alvarez. Yeah. Because he's not going to have either. The, he's obviously not going to have the bonus points there. And the Alvarez is no push. Alvarez could win that match. People, It's a lot more of a toss-up than people really want to believe there. DeSanto's yeah. good. You know, DeSanto could definitely be RBY. I would not be shocked. Beat him the no. first two times they wrestled. Roman Bravo Young won the second two. So they're tied against each other record-wise, you know? And, yeah, that, that's really what that is. You know, you look at 141, Nick Lee versus Ironman. People are going to be split on this, you know, obviously. Ironman looks to be the short favorite. Nick Lee is the, vet, is the guy at the weight class. Ironman hasn't wrestled in his weight class for a while now. And I think it's 100% a toss-up. I, I, whoever you pick, like, I wouldn't be shocked if either one of them were to win. Looking at his Big Ten records, Sebastian Rivera cannot be counted out, obviously. No, especially at Big Ten. You know, maybe Natty's not going to say too much. You know, I love the dude from Jersey. But, yeah, that, that's what that is there. 49, you look at it. Max Murin, he – Bo Bartlett versus Max Murin. Like, Bo Bartlett, I'm assuming, you know, if he, he's 11 seed, takes out the six, takes out the three, makes it to the two seed. No chance of that happening. Pretty slim possibility, yes. But you, you can't say that he didn't look – he looked great against that. So again, yeah, that's what I also have to be said. Like I'm, I'm a, I'm a Penn State fan. Like I'm gonna root for him every day. But you know, looking at this completely unbiasedly, holding a close match with Sam with anybody doesn't mean anything. You know. Oh yeah. Unless it's Spencer Lee or Jason Nolte for that point. 
those are the two most accomplished, dominant college wrestlers we've seen in a while. And Zane Rutherford, too, you know? Yeah. So, again, looking at 57. <sighs> Brady Berge. I don't think he places higher than Caleb Young, you know? I'm, I'm, I like Caleb Young. I think it's Deacon's weight class. I think he... Young beat him the past couple times. I think this is. I think this is Deacon's weight class now. I think Deacon takes. It. I don't think anybody can beat Deacon in folk style. Freestyle may be Carr's game, but when it comes to freestyle, Deacon's the guy. I fifty seven. Yeah, he fills out the weight class perfectly, as you've seen. The dude's massive, and he's, he's been handling it's it. Yeah. it. It's crazy to see a midweight, lower weight, anybody who can take a shot directly under somebody and get off their knees so effortless and get to their feet and finish. Like, that, that's a skill that you don't see. And it comes with – he uses his size so effectively too, right? Yeah, very, he uses his size very well. 65 is where we kind of have a predicament. Joe Lee versus Alex Marinelli. Obviously, if it matches – I don't even know exactly where to see it, but I think we have to assume that Alex Marinelli is the favorite. You know, Sparks may beat him, probably not. If Sparks beats him, it's in the semis, knocks out Alex Marinelli third, so he doesn't get points for being in the finals. That would be huge just to getting – just cutting the deficit a little bit less, right? 74, this is – you know, this is I, – I see any of the top five guys win. This is just a quick walkthrough of the Penn State Iowa race. I'm not, not going to walk through the whole Big Ten, but number one, we have Michael Kemmerer. Number two, we have Mikey Labriola. Number three, we have Curtis Darachi. Number four, we have – Logan Massa, number five, we have DJ Washington. And number six, we have Caleb Romero. I could see any one of those six guys winning it. I would not be surprised. Yeah. I'll say that right now. I, I think DJ Washington is the guy not to be counted out. Like, I'm not going to count him out. I like Washington, dude, Russell. And Indiana's last, Nate Jackson never won a Big Ten title, I don't think. No. It's been, it's been a while since Indiana had their last Big Ten champion. Like, it'd be cool to see one again, you know? But anyways, I've said it right now. I'm – my, I like Mikey Labriola to win that. In Nebraska, he's been the guy who's on solid on the scene. So, you know, that being said, we walk into 184. Aaron Brooks is the guy. Nelson Brand seed at nine. I don't believe that's going to happen. I believe he does. I, I believe he loses to Zach Barnacle in the round one, and then he wrestles back to like fourth. You know, also that being said, Taylor Venz at a six seed is, is fucked up, to say the least. Man, should, he should def, you know, drops a couple of losses. He should definitely be seen higher than six. I really don't agree with that. You know, it was Aaron Brooks' <laughs> only career loss. I think if he, do, I think he does make the finals. I don't know if he beats Brooks or not, but I think it's definitely possible if he wrestles smart. He said it himself. You know, he, he gets caught up in high scoring matches and shit goes wrong. Yeah, Ben's is somebody who, you know, the year prior, you know, when we had him on the show, he was, he was one or two. You know, he was a one or two seed. Like we, we you know, we talked to him, and he was, he he was just an absolute stud at that time. Then you know he came out this year, and like you said, he was looking more to win matches by a lot of points, and then ended up would you know be you know end up getting caught or end up you know getting behind, mm-hmm. trying to you know do stupid takes on. But then yeah, you towards saw the it. end of this, yeah, towards the end of you know regular season, he's picked it up. You know he looked like you know last year Taylor Benz, you know. He looked like, you know, he was right back where he wanted to be. And, you know, with everything that happened for Nebraska this year, you know, with everything going on, what happened in their resting room, I'm, I'm sure it's tough for all of them. You know, it was, it was a rough year for all the guys from yeah. Nebraska. So, I'm now, you know, just you know, trying to get adjusted and everything yeah, back to, you know, um, back to normal. Christian Miller and everything, you know. It was great to see the win over Wisconsin, you know. Like, I was – I'll be honest, I like Hilger a lot, but I was rooting for Lance that match. And he pulled through, you know. And that, that, that was awesome to see, you know, this this is for Christian Miller. That for them, you know, that's what that is. And being completely realistic, they could have three Big Ten champs. Mikey Labriola, 174. Taylor Venza, 184. And Eric Schultz, 97. You know, if that does Very happen, well. that would be absolutely awesome to see. Chances are probably won't. But, you know, walking to 97, you know, we have Michael Beard from Penn State, who, again, can't be counted out. 95 mm-hmm. lost to Miles Amin, dude. Cam Caffey had the same loss. I think, again, Eric Schultz is my favorite. I think Eric Schultz beats Miles Amin. Everybody has Miles Amin being Eric Schultz. I really don't like the way he means in wrestling. He just does, hasn't looked that – I'm just eh. – but I think um, Michael Beard can definitely be plays out of Jacob Warner, which they probably will meet somewhere in the consolation rounds, unless one of them makes a huge run to the finals. 
Yeah. I mean, he looked great when he wrestled Hoffman from Ohio State, who was ranked number five. I mean, he went out there and put him on his back uh, and stuck him. I'll be honest. I don't think Hoffman's that good. I mean, that, that's just my opinion. I think it's a weird weight class. I think Ferrari has to be somewhere in that top ten also. Jake Woodley from Oklahoma. Yeah. That's what this. I know as, as much as we clown on Asia Ferrari for grabbing that dude's dick and everything and talking shit to everybody, he, he's a good fucking wrestler. You know, I, 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 like, I like the dude. Like, he's from, he was from New Jersey, Blair Academy, Bergen Catholic, before he went to Allen, Texas, right? Bo Nichols old high school, you know? He's went to two of the greatest, three of, two of the greatest high school programs in the country, Bergen Catholic and Blair Academy. And he looked pretty fucking dominant in all those matches. Yeah. Like he would dog and then at that point, he also went to one of the best. He went to one of the best public high school wrestling. Like wrestling no, one of the best public know. high schools. Period. I don't know about wrestling. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. if you've ever seen Allen High School, that shit is crazy. Yeah. It's it's huge, and they have like they have like a whole food court there. I know it's some heavyweight fat shit. I'm saying, but like it, it was actually heavyweight stuff. <laughs> it was actually awesome too. We're looking at that, but when we go to heavyweight, you know, Kirkfoot. It's the biggest wild card in this tournament, hands down. Mm-hmm. Definitely. It is a situation where we've seen him wrestle one match this year. Um, I mean, we've seen Dominic this being said. Him. This being said, if Kirkley, Kirkley wins Big Tens, wins Nationals, he could have undefeated career. And very who's well the, become Who is the only champion. other person to do that? Kiel Sanderson. Oh, Kiel Sanderson, yeah. 159 now. He has an undefeated – Kiel Sanderson lost in his redshirt year. Greg Kirkley has an undefeated redshirt. If Greg Kirkley is somehow just by just a big miracle – I wouldn't even call that big of an upset. Goes out there, beats Mason Paris, beats Gilbert Steeson, beats Tony Cassiope, gets a national title. Gable walks up to WWE. He's probably going to keep gaining ground to Mason Paris with the wrestling room he's had. And now, let's be honest, he's already better than Cassiope, I think, just in my opinion. He might, you know, maybe not. And he's miles ahead of the other field. What other heavyweights are really coming in that could be that good? Nobody. You know? Yeah, he's got a couple before Jimmy Mullen makes a run for college, so. You know, I don't think Jimmy Mullen's going to be – I think Jimmy Mullen and Greg Kirk would be a great match to watch when Jimmy's like a full-grown adult. But right now is like, yeah, like it could he that could, we could see history in the making. People don't realize that. Like that's why I'm rooting for. Him. I'm not rooting for him because I'm a Penn State fan. I'm not rooting for him because I don't like Gable Stevenson or Mason Paris. I do. I I like them. I like watching all of them. Right. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people who watch this might think, think that we don't like like that we don't like yeah. the guys we talk about. I mean, you know, this is all love for everybody we talk about, but like we just can't sit here and be like, oh, we just think. Gable's gonna run through everybody. Like yeah. we gotta, we gotta talk if, about everybody. We gotta give everybody a fair shot. You know, if Kerfoot does win this year, chances are he could be a five-time national champ. Yeah, that could whoop you like that could whoop you like over 180 wins in his career. Almost 200. Yeah. Yeah. Kill Sanders had 159 wins. He could go down as one of the greatest of all time. People don't realize that. Same thing was going for Gable Stevenson. When they pulled his red shirt, he was going all good. And then if he wins out, it is what it is. He's always going to have that one blemish on his career. That's going to be Anthony Kassar. You know, Gable Stevenson is going to – obviously he'd be Anthony Kassar now. You always get that comment on post I make. Paris, I don't know if he can be Anthony Kassar. They, it's not like it was a one-point match. It was an 18-7 to seven match when they wrestled. That being said, though, what, ha- what would happen now when Gable versus Kassar doesn't matter? No. You know, that, that's, that's all that is. Kassar was in the – Kassar is probably the – I hate to say, but he's probably one of the worst national champs we've had in a while at heavyweight. But, you know, he was in the right place at the right time, and he made the right choice, and he, he did what he had to do to win. I mean, you can't really say he was one of the worst national champs. I mean, stat-wise, sure. Stat-wise, sure. Um, yeah, but he put – I mean, other than that big upset yeah, win over like, I get more. That. So what I, I want to say is, like, win, but... everybody's going to talk about Gable Stevenson. Like, oh, this guy can't be Gable. This guy, guy, guy can't do this. guy can't do that. People want to forget that. Okay. Gable Stevenson was a four-time state champ. A guy who was bred to, to be an elite wrestler his entire life. Was expected to be a four-time champ. Was expected to basically never lose after all that. Nick was asked to beat him. He's like, oh, Gwiz is this much older. People don't want to talk about, oh, how Gwiz was 
like a nobody coming into college. You were so fucking bandit, dude. And then he proceeds to win two national titles and then made something of himself. He went on for six. Oh, because I was like a 125 coming into high school. Got to 195. Barely won a state title. Made state tournament once and won a state title as a senior. Comes into college. Doesn't even get the starting spot the year before. Bumps up to heavyweight. Knocks off a two-time All-American. Makes a, already takes a loss in the season. Makes a miracle run. Knocks off Gaylord Stevenson twice to win his national title. You know how much of a Cinderella story that is like to actually think about? They said, you know, everybody who's ever talked to him and has, you know, talked to him about his whole career, he has even said himself that he's one of the luckiest people ever. Yeah. You no, know, to do that his yeah. senior year was one, you know, it's like, it's, it's almost crazy to think that every time he's qualified for a, a postseason tournament, he's won it. Yeah. Technically and, speaking. Yeah, and what I also want to say is, like, everything fell his way that day. Seating, matches, everything fell his way. If Kassar, Shots were clicking. Defense was not working. And he was, you know, everything was good for him. Yeah. Everything was if, in his favor. Yeah. I will also say some of the matches people don't talk about that could have affected this a lot. If Trent Hilger didn't be Yusuf Amita in the round of 16, Yusuf yeah. Amita had one of the greatest matchups to be in. He just never got a shot to wrestle him. Yusuf Amita got one hand on a knee pick. Kassar would have been right to his back. Yeah. Kassar True. matches great up against Ogre. Kassar matches up great up against Orndorff. Made sure great up against Antonio Polisi in the round 32. You know, great battle against Yellow Stevenson and Derek White. You know, Derek White matches up good against Kassar. Kassar was just having the run and, like, he's not going to let it end there. And he, yeah, plus he caught him slipping, tucked him to his back. Favor. It is what it is. Yeah. And if you put him on the top half of the bracket, you know, if Stencil gets his chance on top, chance it could you it could very well be over. Like people people forget that. Like right place at the right time. What are you gonna do? Shit on the dude for that? Like he took what he had and he made the best of it and he won. But anyways, going back to um Greg Kerfoot. I think we we can't deny that Greg Kerfoot's a better wrestler than Anthony Kassar. He he is. That's, that's just what it is. Yeah, That's the thing, though, you have to think about. Like, we, we always talk about this every time we ever bring up Penn mm-hmm. State. The wrestling room is changing it's, these kids. It's the best room These the guys come in from high school, and they sit in that wrestling room for a couple months, and then they start wrestling, and it's insane. Yeah. You know, I've seen Bo Bartlett wrestle in high school. Multiple times I've seen Bo wrestle. He wasn't. And the way he – the way he is wrestling now is incredible. Yeah. Same thing I'm, th- I'm sure you could say of Robert Howard. You've yeah. watched Robert Howard wrestle. How Rob Howard, again, one of the greatest New Jersey wrestlers of all time. Won't go down like that because he's only two-time state champ. Lost twice in the state finals. One to Antonio Menino and one to Sammy Alvarez. Both, he was kind of stunned in overtime, you know? But, and I look at him now, he's wrestling incredibly. He's, he's incredibly wrestling the yet. same way, I'll be honest. He did in high school. It's just like, he went to the greatest high school. He's always had the pressure on him. Kale Sanderson does a very good job of, like, building these kids mentally so they, they can progress good. And that's why I think Carthley goes so under the radar is because he doesn't talk shit. He wrestles. He goes, you know, doesn't do anything yeah. crazy. Even when he hit that enough. guy, like, there was no celebration. He, he got up. Yeah, got up, got his hand raised, and walked up. And I don't want to talk about this, but I probably should. Every time I've seen the post about Mason Paris, there's always one person who likes it, which is Gable Stevenson. And he, why do you think he does that to Mason Paris' post? Because he views Mason Paris as a potential threat. That's obviously has to be what it is, right? He's competition. If I post something about, like, no, no shade there, but about the Maryland dude, Gable's not taking his effort to like it, right? I posted the matches on Kirkfield. Guess who liked it? Gable Stevenson. Gable Stevenson. I think if Gable views him as potential competition, that should supersede any position, any other opinion right there. I don't care what fucking Christian Powell says, what Mike Mao, what Bader says. If Gable Stevenson says he's competition, you he can Gable Stevenson knows he's good, right? Every the match I was reading an article, because I I just I was reading into like a lot their match in high school. Gable said, when I'm gone, be the best guy out there. 
That's what he said. No? Yeah, so then, then did, after that match, uh, Kirk bumped back down to 220, right? And then wrestled the rest of the way, the rest of the year at 220. The state. It wasn't even close. So. Yeah. But also, in the interview, Gil said, yeah, it's a good win. Shouldn't have been that close. And he also said, next time, we were, no disrespect to or shade Greg Kirk Fleet, but next time we wrestle, it won't be that close. So next that video is easily up accessible on the internet. So will his words come back to bite him in the ass? Probably not. But who knows? Very well can, yeah. Again, the thing that I've always been saying is why would why would Kale Sanderson put him out there if he didn't think he could win? No, there's no reason why he Kale's wouldn't. a guy again. You he, know, he, he had, you know he he had a very about. capable heavyweight. He had a he very know, capable yeah. heavyweight. Oh, that was, ne- that, Neville's qualifies for Neville's yeah, he, he just previously came off of a win over Orndor. What I'm gonna say is Neville's, Neville's would have gotten yeah. the exact same seat. If that's what yeah. Whether never to be Hilger or not, Lance or not, Neville's beat Lance, right? And he beat Luffman too. Mm-hmm. And he beat Orndorff. Yeah. So what I want to say here is, Kale Sanders guy is not is not going to force his wrestlers to go out there. You know, Tom and Terry Brands possibly. You know, that's just that's just the Iowa mentality. No shade to them or whatever, but like, their guys. You know, they mental toughness is what they preach, right? And we know that. Looking at Kale Sanderson, though, when Nick Sirianna got injured, he just – he's like, we're here for him. We want him to get better. He's not going to go out there until he's, he's ready to compete. Nick Sirianna is just a whole different animal. A full, he's 100% wrestling. That's all he does. He lives – he eats and breathes, lives and breathes, whatever the fuck I was going to say. He's all wrestling. But, you know, the, I, he didn't like that. He went to Rutgers. Uh, you know, I don't believe in what he said. You know, that made me lose a little bit of respect for him. But, you know, he's, again, he's one of my favorite wrestlers. And he'd probably continue to be that. But, you know, it all worked out for the better. He won a national title, right? But that's crazy thing. But if Siriano was still there, if we had in, I wouldn't be close to Penn State. I, I, I wholeheartedly believe. You know, even if Spencer Lee beats Nick Siriano, it's a decision. So. Yeah. It's like whatever, right? But. Now let's think about this from Paris' perspective. I know I've been hyping up Kirk to it a lot, but what the Paris is wrestling? Miles Amin, Adam Kidd. You know, that's what that is. How does yeah, I mean, that compare yeah, to he's wrestling with, Adam Kidd? He's wrestling another one of the greatest heavyweights. Th- you know? Those are two Olympians, technically. I think um, uh, Miles Amin's going to be an uh, Olympian for San Marino, and Kuhn's going to be uh, our Greco heavyweight, most likely. You know? Yeah. I'll be honest, I've been talking about Schultz. Can you pull an upset? But probably not. At the, at the Mateo Pelicone, Colton Schultz and Adam Kinnear meet first round. You know, you have Sergei Semenov from Russia, I think it is. And you have Riza Kale from Turkey, who most likely going to be in the finals. And Riza probably takes it to him, I'll be honest, right there. I don't think anybody can beat Riza. You know, I've never seen a man like Adam Kuhn ever been picked up and latch dropped before. Kuhn's a tank. But Greco, Greco is... People don't respect Greco enough in the U.S. People around the world, yes, they did, 100%. You know? Because Greco was just as big as folks stopped wrestling a while back. You know, guys like Corral and Lopez. I don't want to say this, but time come the Olympics, there's going to be one guy with their eyes on them, right? But everybody has their eyes on you No, know? and who's that going to be? It's not Spencer Lee. It's not Jordan Burroughs. It's not Yazdani. It's not Saad July. It was going to be Mihan Lopez Nunes in Cuba. And he most likely will. He's like 40 years old now. If he wins, he will go down as the best, most accomplished wrestler, wrestler of all time. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and that's crazy to think about. He, he, in the 2004 Olympics, he did not win a single medal. You know, that's, that's even crazier. Again, back to Mason Paris, though. If Mason Paris keeps progressing at the rate he did from his freshman to sophomore year, I would not be surprised if he comes out there, beats Kirk, beats Gable, and beats Wisdowski for the Olympic spot. But let's, let's think about this from an expected. Let's compare in college, obviously. 
you know, who are the two smartest wrestlers on the, on the senior level? Gwizdowski and Dom. They've been on there the longest. Close matches will most likely go to them every single time. You saw Gwizdowski beat Gable before the foreign criteria twice. He's Dom. He's a smart wrestler. knows how to hold close matches. That being said, let's look at Gable, Kirk Fleet, and Bears. What is Gable's main weakness? His gas tank, right? I guess, yeah. But I feel like this year he looked He's improved, as right? gas as But again, yeah, who has definitely. he wrestled and who has he actually gotten seven minutes with? Cassiope? Obviously, yeah, obviously Gable's have to Gable is going to have it. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't say that. I've seen a lot of big guys who are in very good shape. Tan Orndorff's in pretty good shape. He just doesn't provide the athleticism factor that Cassiope does. Let's be right there. His weakness compared to Mason Parison and Greg Kerfley, he has a weaker gas tank, right? Mm-hmm. What is he better at technique? technique. Better than Mason Paris. Slightly better than Greg Kerfley. Mason Paris probably has the worst technique out there, which is still pretty fucking good. I'll put Kerfley a second. Speed. It's all about the dunk. Speed is what I'm talking about. Pure athleticism. They attack in different ways, Kirkfleet and Gable. I think speed-wise, they're tied, and maybe Kirkfleet is just like the slightest bit faster. You know, people don't want to – people think just because you're smaller, you're faster. No, I'm sorry to tell you. But if you watch Gable, Steve, and Kyle Snyder wrestle, Gable edges them out. Nobody's ever going to want to agree with this, but it's true. I'm sorry. But now we'll go hand fighting. And strength. Hand fighting goes to Gable. And strength goes to Mason Paris. Mason Paris is strong as doing NCAA. No, no doubt about it. Right? I don't know. I think healthy Pat Brucky is stronger than Mason Paris. 800 pound squat? Never mind. I have a late crucial insight. Yeah, shut the fuck up. I'm sorry. <laughs> I want to see Mason Paris in a Michigan football uniform. You know, he's talking about the IC. I can very – look at this, right? Don Bradley's going to be gone soon. Probably it's going to be his last run at the Olympics. You know, I obviously – like, I truly hope if anybody makes an underdog run, it's Don Bradley. But – I agree. You know, I genuinely like the dude. I'll be honest. Like, I, w- I, I would not be – I do. I he, he, Like, out of everybody we talked to, he was just one of the most, like, nice, genuine guys. Like, yeah, even with, knows, like when the recording like, yeah. was off. Like, he was like, if you guys ever need anything, like, just reach out yeah. to me. Like, I'll try my best. Like, yeah, when he's he, a great dude, like, you know? He, yeah, like, he, he like, he, he's, he's a great, he's a great dude. Just, just hands down, you know? We talked to Jacob Casper, too. Yeah, great. Jake Casper. Qualified through awesome. the Olympic tri- trials, it's nice. And, you know, most likely he's, he's not here. He's not doing that. Let's be honest. Right. Looking I'm excited at- for the return of one person. Speaking about Olympic wrestling. The return of Pat Downey. I've never been more excited. Bro, Pat Downey's dad tried to check me in the comment section. Really? Yeah, I cursed him out. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we can't get Pat Downey on the podcast. Why? Because I cursed out his dad. Who cares? The lizard kick doesn't care. Guess the fuck he does. He has me blocked. He's not coming on our podcast. I'll ask him. No, we're not. Don't ask him, first off. But no, seriously yeah. though, if you look at it, you know, will Paris being older than Kirkley really play a fact? You know, that's why I realize how come people only talk about age when it's Gable versus Kassar? Nobody ever talks about age when it's Gable versus somebody younger than him, or Paris versus somebody yeah. younger than him. Yeah. Nobody wants to talk about how Kirkley's a redshirt freshman while Gable is a junior. You know, only a year older, but a year is huge, right? A year was the difference between him getting tech fold by Kuhn and him tech folding Kuhn. A year is the difference between him losing 4-4 to four on criteria between Nick Wazdowski and him beating Nick Wazdowski 4-1. to one. A year was him losing 2-2 two to two to Don Bradley, beating Don Bradley 7-1, to one. you know? A year is fucking huge, right? That's grown man strength. Let's be honest right there. You know, a guy like Kassar is again 25, sure, right? But, yeah, that is what it is. You can't really compare that, you know, like – I don't think age isn't an excuse to lose. Uh-oh. You know, at the division, yeah. level, same thing I've said. Weight isn't an excuse. Kyle Snyder was two twenty five when he lost to Adam Coon. Did you hear this man say anything? He was like, "Oh, he weighed more than me. He weighed more than me." No, you're fucking. No, Adam Coon was two eighty five point oh, like on the scale two eighty five, all of two eighty five. Yeah, uh, the of course. He, he, he has every. He has every right to be. That's the weight class. You know, you knew what you signed up for. 
If Kyle Schneider wanted to, he could have very well stayed down at 97. You know, but he didn't. And he ended up very – Yeah, and I feel like that's also why you see why you see Schneider now not wrestling 125 kg because – I mean, he, he, knows he, that that he obviously can't because I don't, you know, God, again, I've been saying this from heavyweights. Heavyweights tend to mature their body. takes longer to mature than guys like 125. Spencer Lee, Nick Sirianna is not getting much bigger than that. He's not getting uh-huh. stronger than that. Yeah, he's right there. You know, obviously, it's mostly technique shit you can refine on. Nick Wazdowski, if you look at Nick Wazdowski's senior year of college and look at Nick Wazdowski now, it's night and day, dude. You know? Look at Tony. Now, Tony Nelson was always just a jack freak. Yeah. You know, Tony Nelson was always good. Travel Wagner was a D2 wrestler for UNK. University of Nebraska Tyranny, I think it is. Uh, two-time Olympian. You know, one match away from getting the medal. That tech fought by Gino Petrosvili in the bronze medal match. You know, that, that's, those are things you got to look at. But ultimately, I will say my pick is Kerfoot. I try to look at this in the most unbiased way as possible. If you guys have any questions or things that I just didn't, look into just drop them below right no I'll, I'll be sure to answer them in the comment section whether you drop it here or whether you drop it on instagram I'll, I'll answer the questions you have you know completely honestly but i do think paris is favored in this match i think people really i don't know if paris can get to kirk it's like that that means a problem right paris has had trouble hitting the dump like, on well. very tall people and this is where it comes into effect yusuf amita in the wrestling room you know Paris, I'm not going to use any of Paris's freshman matches because Paris is a completely different wrestler. That, that's just being said. Gable, yeah, is a better wrestler than he was his freshman year. Not, not the level of how, better, how much better Paris got. You know? Paris is night and day where he was. And they both have the most valuable thing I think you can have, which is a win over Nick Wazdowski. You know, I think at this yeah. division, you know, no, I, I love Nick Wazdowski, but he's the best guy. He targets on his head. And it's going to remain that way. Yeah, Kirkfield didn't get the chance to wrestle him. I don't. I don't know very well. I could see Kirkfield placing just placing seventh and going zero two in Nationals. I would not be surprised. I also wouldn't be surprised if he comes out there beats everybody. He just just goes undefeated the rest of his career. And that's why it goes down as so much of a wild card. Like you're just in the position you don't know. See, like it. Uh, I don't know what to say. Like at this point, right? Because it could go any other way, right? Personally, I want Kirkfield yeah. to win. I think he has all the tools in the match to go in his favor. It's like, I've said this before, brute strength and athleticism will win you matches up to a point. And if that's the deciding factor, it definitely has to lean towards Paris. If Paris can just muscle him into a dump, Paris will win. If Paris can ride him on yeah. top and turn him, Paris will win. If yeah. Paris cannot get to his legs, Kirkfield will. If Kirkfield yeah, can like, Kirk 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 what, like, get to leg four. attacks, Kirkfield will win. Kirkfield's much more athletic than Mason Paris. You know, I don't know. Kerfield's very strong. Four four twenty bench, probably six hundred pound deadlift. Deadlift squat's probably gonna be a little bit weak, just because he's not a lo- much of lower body dominant guy. And he has the exact same build, which Gable seems to have trouble with, which is a taller build. Nick Wazdowski, he kind of is gonna. Nick Wazdowski's not the tall six three, probably right. Tony Nelson's like what six five six six. He's had problems with that. It's tall guys who can move. Yusuf Amita, he tech fought Yusuf Amita in freestyle, but it took him nearly six minutes. How often do we see Gable Stevenson go six minutes in a match in freestyle? Now. <laughs> not, not very often. Tony Nelson's, again, a guy you can't really use that too much, but Tony Nelson's a guy, again, that's given Gable trouble. He's beaten him before. Gable beat him 4-1 to one at the trials before he um, – the U.S. Open before he beat Adam Kuhn in the finals, right? Kuhn's obviously, again, going to be some gray area right there because Kuhn's a Greco guy. I don't think that that loss to Gable really means anything. I think – Kuhn's transition is focused in Greco, and that's what he's best at, you know? You throw Gable out there in a Greco match, he's getting tossed. You know, I think Gable would admit that himself. He's not a Greco guy. Again, looking at it, Tony Nelson, he wrestles with every day. He's not going to come out there and tech. And that's why, again, looking at these Olympic trials, it's going to – depends how the matchups fall. It's going to be Nick Wazdowski's favor because he gets to buy the finals because he's a world medalist. And that may be the deciding factor for this. You know, hopefully – we see a fresh Gable, Paris, Dom, or Kirk Lee in the finals, or even Tony Nelson in the finals. But the chances of that happening are not very good when the whole thing is wrestling in one day. Right? And that has to be said. And technically, right? Is, doesn't Gwiz have, like, a bye to the finals? Yeah, because he's a world medalist. Yep. Snyder has a bye to the finals. Jaden has a bye to the semifinals. So that means, technically, Kyvin and Gadsden and Colin Moore are going to be wrestling for a chance to Jaden Cox. I think if Colin Moore wins that match like he typically has in the past, Colin Moore is giving Jaden – 
Last time Colin Moore and Jane Cox wrestled, people don't want to do this because they're so caught up in the hype of how guys have been performing. Jaden Cox didn't give up an offensive point to you, right? At 92 kilograms, not 97. This has been said over and over again. You know, Jaden Cox is a hell of a fucking wrestler. Said over and over again. Non-Olympic weight classes are easier than Olympic weight classes. That's just been said. You saw that firsthand with Chimizo and Dig. Dig's been way more dominant at 79 than Chimizo was at 74 or even 7 when he was down there. They come down as a one-point match, and the only takedown was scored by Chimizo. You know, Dake was bigger, and he just seemed to be able to gut wrench him better. That's all it is. Time come when Dake has to cut down 74, I don't think he's the better wrestler than Burroughs. That's, that's just what I'm going to say. We had the whole thing about Isaiah Martinez. I think Isaiah Martinez is getting this really dark horse in this weight class. Sorry if I'm talking really fast, but we're just going to do that, right? And he's at 61, right? Nishan Garrett was the guy at 61. He Joe Colon, did very well. Joe Colon ultimately got the spot because Nishan Garrett was out. But Nishan Garrett, again, is the guy who's stuck in the gray area. Like, it's hard for him to cut to 57, and uh, he's kind of under, he's kind of losing matches at 65, right? James Green has had trouble cutting down 65, but he's done it, you know? If I just say, if James Green can make the cut very smoothly, he can definitely be our guy at 70. I wouldn't doubt that. Kyle Dake is 79. Jaden Cox is 92. That comes a problem, right? Taylor is dominated. Though. Taylor is easily the most dominant wrestler in the U.S. That's what I'll say. Taylor is a more dominant wrestler than Jaden Cox, which is for the sole fact that his weight class is hard. You know, obviously, I don't think Yazdani hasn't been the same since he moved up from 74 to 86. He's, he's still building into the weight class. I, I see just a little bit. You know, it's probably going to be closer to match this time they wrestle, but that's what it is, right? Consensus number one in the world is Abdul Rashid Sajulai, if that's not changing in freestyle, right? You look at that match, that's a real place where they're wrestling for a second. You know, let's be honest, like Muhammad Muhammadian is, I have whoever's in the U.S. taking third, taking one of the bronze medals. Because also, come on, mix it. There, there are there's one gold medal, one silver medal, and two bronze medals given out every weight class. So, wherever you want to put that, you know, Jaden Cox will very end up with the silver or bronze. You know, it depends on who wrestles rest the bear on that day, and where your draw comes. Because you could vary their seeds are random, you know, and mostly random. You know, against if you have two defending Olympic champions in the weight class. You, People are just out here counting out cops and everything. It's nothing. It's probably going to be extremely boring as two to one match. And again, that that becomes the main problem. It's like people don't realize how good Saj Live is. That man could bump up to one twenty five and win the Olympic title if he really wanted to. Yeah. That being said, though, again, I'm I'm sorry. I'm going a little bit off track, right? And you look at the Kerfley matchup. I don't know. Kerfield gets a matchup. Kerfield is going to have another match on the first day against Jack Hayab. If he doesn't tech fall Jack Hayab, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like he'll pin him. He, pro- he should pin him. Thing is, people don't realize Kerfield can ride on top very well with legs, and he can – He's a guy. extremely underrated top rider. You know, it's going to come down to – if he can get down – if he can get out from bottom, he can be anybody in the country. You know? I want to see the Colton Schultz. Match. The thing, you know, I've been talking like about, about that. Not knowing, like everybody's so in the dark with making their like their picks for Big Ten mm-hmm. because we've only seen him wrestle once, and the guy didn't even get off. He, he, the guy didn't have a chance to do anything. The guy didn't have a chance to ride him. The guy put down three casual him. takedowns on both the guys in under a minute each, and hit them both with a cradle and pin them. Yeah, you know you it. don't. You really don't know what to expect right here, right? All we can go is what we've seen in the past, and that's a. Uh, Pretty much Mason Paris did it, Gable Stevenson did it. They decimated the fields in high school, and that's just as expected with the wrestle of that caliber, right? Yeah. That being said, ultimately, I don't know. I think Paris has to be favored until proven. Paris is number two until proven wrong, right? Kirk gets a seven seed. I can't, I can't move him any higher until he beats them. Trent Hoger's an all I, I would put him below Orndorff, too, if I really have that choice. But in seeding, but that's just because seeding is what it is. You go by criteria. His only wins over the 14th best kid. You could theoretically throw a Greg Kirkley in that 13 if you wanted to, and that would make sense. And that's where multiple problems arise. You know, you throw him in a 13, who's that match him up with? The, uh, the four seed, which is Luke Luffman. 
that that is a nightmare for Luke Luffman, dude. Let, let's be honest. A guy who can present the speed, present the gas tank, and has the length, and is very good at attacking, will, will dominate Luffman any day. I think a matchup that could go either way, I don't want to say it because I think it might fall different, is Trent Hilbert versus Kirk Fleet. Maybe an interesting matchup. For the sole fact that Hilger has the best defense I've seen when you're in on his leg. True. He will cut the corner on you, and he will scramble with you any day. Mason Paris doesn't like doing that. We'll hit the same thing, just try to power you over. Gable Stevenson will use his speed to stalemate the position. And Cassiopeia will use his hips to shut you down immediately. If you get stuck yeah, on Cassiope, Cassiope is a mountain. stuck under Cassiope, it's not even because he's big. He uses his hips fantastically well, which is what people say. Yeah. Right? Just because you're 285 doesn't mean you can just lay on something and sprawl expecting not to finish. Any heavyweight at the division level, if you hit a crappy sprawl, they're, they're powering through you and running you over. 285 is not as heavy as people think. It's not that big. You know, you're telling me, you're telling me these 125s can't squat 285 pounds, the All-Americans, they, they 100% can't. These guys are out here squatting 100 pounds. If you think they can't lift you up in the air if you don't hit a good sprawl, no. You have to pressure your hips yeah. in perfectly, and Cassiope, Cassiope makes up for everything he lacks very fucking well. That being said, let's. I think this is when we make our picks. You know, I'll, I'll be honest. I have Kirk. I think I wouldn't be surprised who wins. I don't want to say anything. If Kirk Field loses, it's gonna be fucking awkward. But I mean, based on what I've said, based on what I've looked through, I've watched so much film on this. I think either way, it's, I'm, it's gonna. It's like if Paris loses, he walks way back to third. Yeah. Oh yeah. Paris. Paris isn't a tech fault type of guy. Paris is like a domination kind of guy. If Paris yeah. walks his way back, theoretically, the guys that can pull, you can pull Hilger right there. You know, obviously, Hilger is a guy who's going to run with you for six to seven minutes in folk style. Freestyle is not his thing, let's be honest, right? Lance almost beat him at uh, Senior Nationals. It was a six to nine match, right? You know, then he pulls a guy like Cassiope to get to the, in the third, fourth match. That's going to be, that's, chances are, Cassiope goes seven minutes, right? I wouldn't be surprised if Paris spins again, but I severely doubt it. Let's just be honest. Like that, that, sh- that shocked me more than anything I've ever seen. Is Cassiope getting pinned like that? You know, again, Cassiope's a guy also Paris can show off his athleticism that. So getting into our picks, I don't want to say anything crazy, but I will I want I have Kirk Fleet winning. So you can go. I I'm going to agree with you. Uh, Kirk wins this match. I don't think it's going to be... What's your score prediction? I'm going to go... I'm going to go... uh, I'm going to go 3-2. I don't want my prediction to seem so crazy, though. Uh, I think it's gonna be close. If it's, I, I really, I just don't, I don't see this match being a super high scoring match. I just don't. I don't want to say it. I, I think if Kirk can very well turn him if he gets the chance. I okay. I could agree with that. I I could I could counteract my own and say that if Kirk gets him on his back or at least over a shoulder, he's going to his back. Okay, I don't want to say it. I'm going to say it right here. I'm sorry if this doesn't age you very well. It could age you very bad. I think Kirk Fields, Paris is probably going to win this match. I'll say this right now. But just, I like to be optimistic with my picks. You all know that. I have Kirk Fleet winning. I have, okay, you know, I'll say it. I have Greg Kirk Fleet winning 7-4. to four. That's not too crazy. I don't I think that's too to crazy prediction. No, obviously, he, I don't think he texts. If he, watch him actually tech him enough, I'm going to have to post this shit. But, you know, that being said, you know, I think he matches up great in every single aspect except for top and bottom. It's when he's on bottom against all freshmen. You see that Adam Kuhn walking in with the one seed, placing seventh at Big Tens. You know how crazy that is? Yeah. And the guy as big as Adam Kuhn, you see, like, he develops that pretty easily. Yeah, that being said, you know, um, uh, yeah, we said, we said what we said. Drop your predictions below. Who wins this match and wants to score, you know? I'll pin if, – if you guess it right, you guess it first, I'll pin your comment, I guess. You know, um, yeah. So that being said, thank you guys for watching the Late Night Shots podcast. It's been episode 53, and we will see you guys again next time. Peace. Peace.